Okay. Oh, oh whoa! I, yeah, I hear yeah, you guys. Hear? Yeah. Cool. Jay's is <laughs> Jay's is really clear. Yours what? comes in. Like oh, your okay. sound comes in really yeah, well. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It does. Okay. I'm gonna start this. Great. to the podcast. I am Becky, and of course, we have our co-host here, Jay. Adios. Hi. No, adios. not adios. Adios means goodbye. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was a long Get day today, so, yeah. Goodbye, Jay. <laughs> well, okay, Jay is here. He's Hola. not leaving. Correction. And, well, we are the happy project. That was so anticlimactic, <laughs> but we are the happy project. And let's start with you, Jay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah. yeah it's been a crazy week. You're speaking Spanish at the wrong <laughs> times, at the wrong moments. Yeah, it was a long day. I was about 20 minutes late here, but yeah. Don't worry Excited about to... It. We're happy to have you. And yes, you. you've probably already heard her laughing in the mic. <laughs> Get used to it because she she laughs quite a lot. Well, Jay was ready to leave the minute he introduced himself. He was like, peace Hang out. On. Calm down. Introducing Let's- Jay. Peace. <laughs> Later. Let me introduce our guest before things get a little too crazy here. Sitting to my right over here, we have Kayla. Your last name is Lim, right? I guess in Korean it's Im. Im, right? Mm. Im Kayla. But Kayla, thank you for joining us on the podcast. Why don't you just briefly introduce yourself for everybody? Oh, well, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm just so happy and so excited to be here. I think we've talked about my affinity for Seoul and just for South Korea and being Korean. And when I met you, I think it was just a couple of days ago yeah. in Hongdae, uh-huh. in the middle of the street, uh-huh. we learned about the project and I was like, I want to do it. Like, this sounds like it could be so fun, so amazing to do. So it's great to be here. Did yeah. she just, like, pull you out of the crowd and be like, Oda, are you happy? Like, like okay, she's that's been usually known to what do. I do. Yeah. I Is usually it? do that. Yeah. Have you ever been wrong? You know, yes, I was wrong once. And guess who it was? Who? It was uh, the guy who's in charge of Asian Boss Channel. Oh, really? <laughs> Ka- K? Is his name? Or Kai? I, I don't know. He's yeah. half Japanese. Okay. And I saw him briefly in passing. And I was like, hey. Are you hey are you happy? He's like, Yes, I am. Like oh. and then I was telling you about the happy project. He's like, Hold up, hold up. I'm half Japanese. And I was like, Oh my gosh, I got too excited. And then later on, my friend was like, Do you know who that was? He said, No, who is that? Like, he's the guy who does Asian boss. Nice. <laughs> so, good job, Becky. Good well, job. He's technically still half. Then. He is happy, yeah, but so I was saying wrong. like half Korean, da da da. You yeah, should yeah. be on the show, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, Wait, wait, wait. I'm half Japanese. <laughs> and then he just left. Okay, <laughs> bye. So he was like, Adios, y'all. Adios. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> to quote Jay. <laughs> yeah. But that's true. We met each other pretty much on the street of Hongdae mm-hmm. and we were just walking by. Um, and then, yeah, you just have a very infectious energy. Like, oh, thank very, you. Lots of brightness about you. And so we actually had coffee together. And then she was sharing with me about her story. And that's why I thought you'd be perfect to have on the podcast to talk more about that. And we'll get into that. But first, just for our listeners who are joining in for the first time here on the podcast. So we talk about the half Korean experience. We really go more in depth. And it's just kind of a time to chat and have discussions. Sometimes it can be funny. Sometimes it gets serious. And mind you, we're not experts when it comes to discussing, you know, political issues concerning, let's say, race or culture or even history. Um, But we are very curious about these things. And And so ready to learn and about it always too, yeah. ready to learn that's a really good input and uh, we really like to focus on our personal experiences and the stories of our guests and just see where that takes us so we're really excited to see where we go today and so Kayla of course welcome thank you to the happy project yes so what did you first think when you heard about us when you heard about the happy project what was something that came to your mind I think I first visited your Instagram page, Mm -hmm. and as I was scrolling through the first few posts and the way you were speaking about your guests, I I thought like, wow, this is this is so interesting to learn. And second, the couples that were getting interviewed or the family that you just Mm -hmm. did was really insightful, and the way that they see that their baby getting grown up in Korea as a happy that wasn't my experience at all. But Mm -hmm. you know, I think getting to get that other point of view, it was a little refreshing. I think that. It's an exciting project that you've finally taken off the ground, and that's what excites me the most mm-hmm. when people just bring their ideas to fruition. And it's so much hard work and a lot of dedication. So the Happy Project in itself is like pretty amazing, and I'm, it's such an honor to be in it like, in the early stages. And what's become now, what it'll be, is even probably even more enormous. Thank you. That's really that's really nice. To yeah, hear, yeah, it's really encouraging to hear that. And we're so happy that you took your time out because you're only here for a short time. I know. Right? I'm so sad. You <sighs> visit, but you visit Korea every year. I do. Bro, and you said about three weeks, mm-hmm. right? And this is something you've been doing since you were really, really young. 
I, I came every summer mm-hmm. and I would come for the whole summer. Oh, okay. Right. And then when I start working, getting a holiday for a whole summer is, mm-hmm. is not. <sighs> That's almost a dream like, right there. <laughs> right. Unless yeah. I quit the jobs in between. <laughs> and then my resume is going to have like a pattern. Like, what do you, where do you go for like this <laughs> quarter? <are> <laughs> Yeah. But I, yeah, I come for three weeks. Sometimes I negotiate about working like APAC hours mm-hmm. while I'm here Mm-mm. and just spending time with my grandmother and her middle son, who's my uncle, Mm-mm. and getting to just explore the city again. And I always visit some childhood spots mm-hmm. too, okay. like the playgrounds in my complex mm-hmm. area. Okay. The the net, I don't know if you know, like that net isn't really in a lot of other places. Like Are you talking that, about like the badminton nets? No, the tightrope net that creates a pyramid that you climb as a oh, child. Oh, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have that back in the States. Like we had just the normal swings and, and tubes and slides right. but over here they're way more interactive so yeah. much more fun make you stretch your body as a child in all these complex <laughs> ways and those are like the playgrounds that i'll visit and i'm like i remember when you would go i would never leave the net i was mm. like i'm never going home <laughs> and people in, in seoul like they would be outside till so late like mm-hmm. it's like 11 12 p.m and mm-hmm. here's their six-year-old child still outside with the parent mm-hmm. and you're playing tennis probably like with someone else over there and we're just getting started on the merry-go-round and just the liveliness of it all mm-hmm. Well, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. You did say, so we know that you've come to Korea pretty much every year for your whole life. And you just mentioned now back in the States. So why don't you give us a little bit more about your background, like where you were born, where you grew up, this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Born and bred northern New Jersey and New York. Mm -hmm. I recently took my career to the West Coast working in Southern California. Mm -hmm. West Coast, baby. Yes. Yeah, so no one, no one got excited yeah, about that. We're, we're just <laughs> Except for me, yeah. Bypass that, Jay. Oh, okay, Adios. All right. So, all right. Now, your dad's Korean. If I'm remembering from our conversation, we have a cafe. Your dad is Korean. Yes. Your father's mom's... Korean. I get limb from my father. Uh huh. And then your mother's Native American. Yes. Yeah. So, which side of the family did you usually like? When you think about your home and the culture that you grew up in your home, mm-hmm. what kind of culture was more prevalent? in your upbringing as a child when in your childhood i guess yeah short answer uh korean all the way Mm -hmm. but i you know scribe born and bred in northern new jersey but there was a one year that i was raised on the reservation Mm -hmm. it was my first year of education when my parents had split i was very young four years old five years old and my mother had taken us first Mm -hmm. so it was my sister and i my sister's three years older she took us and we lived on the reservation with her family Mm -hmm. and i remember that that was kindergarten for me And I guess after first grade, came to live with my father in New Jersey, who's Korean, and my mother was out of the picture ever since. Mm -hmm. So I did have some time on the reservation, but most of my upbringing was was in my Korean household, where Mm -hmm. we, like, took off our shoes, ate, you know, rice and soup when the occasion called for it. Every New Year's, we would bow. Mm -hmm. And uh, it definitely had all the Korean vibes of, like, hardwood and floor, the Totari in the summer mm. would come yeah. out, <laughs> and my dad was incredibly. Eco- I say economical, but it really was cheap. <laughs> like we wouldn't ever use our dryer. He would want to hang the laundry, oh, yeah, because yeah, 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 that's yeah. cheaper. Right. Yeah, and he yeah. would just spin it as like we're saving energy. And I was like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and every appliance is LG or Samsung because we're loyal. <laughs> <laughs> Do you recognize any of those things in uh, your growing up, I mean, up, we Jay? definitely use a dryer, thankfully. <laughs> but, um, yeah, my dad, actually, he just switched over to iPhone, and mm. I was always giving crap for, like, having, like, a crappy LG phone. Aww. He was like, i got to stay loyal to the home plan. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally understand what she's saying. Now it's there. blue messages all the time. Yeah, ah. and and so uh, he actually, yeah, we have a Kia car now, too. Or, a Kia car? Or, no, so they have a Kia car. Yeah. Wait, Ikea has cars? Kia. Oh, not Kia. Ikea. Ikea. Not Ikea. Oh, so I was like, Ikea. Get your Korean brand straight, Becky. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, actually, they bought, like, two Kia cars. Okay, all right. Well, let's pretend that didn't happen. Okay. So, your, was your dad, <laughs> your dad was, uh, your dad's first gen, right? First generation Korean. Correct. Mm-hmm. And actually, can you describe to me, like, what do you define as first gen? I would say born in Korea and then maybe immigrated. Okay. Over to another country. Okay. However, it you know I think the line can become a little blurred because it's totally blurred in the states. There's some so people blurred. who will go to Korea or back or to another country at a very young age, and would you still consider yourself right. first gen? My my parents consider themselves like 1.5 mm-hmm. gen. I mm-hmm. think my dad would. I forget exactly how old he was, but he was like in middle school or high school, uh-huh. and my mom was like college age. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, so I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Did they choose the West Coast? So my parents' family, my dad's family, moved over to Virginia of all places, and then uh, my dad like bounced all the way to California <laughs> and met my mom there. Yeah. Uh, where in California? I don't even know where they met, actually, but 
I'm from um, Cerritos, which is like a small city in the suburbs of L.A. County. Okay. Yeah. Do you know? I don't. It's there? probably like But closest... L.A. has so many Koreans. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's like one of the... I think it has the biggest Korean population outside of Korea, mm. maybe. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. There's... No way. Because, I mean, you could go your whole life in uh, living in Los Angeles without speaking any other language mm. besides Korean. Same mm. with Koreatown, Manhattan. And really? it's just one street. Yeah, it's just one what? street. I've met, I've met like, Harmonida, yeah. who... who sp- can't read or speak English. Oh, and, and they live in Manhattan. Yes. Well, they won't live there, but they'll spend most of their time working there in oh. the back kitchens. Oh. Yeah. So they don't ever need to interact with an American. Oh, wow. And they live under the radar. Like, everything's in cash. Mm-hmm. I'm sure they're not identified, but wow. they never speak English. Surprising. Yeah. A Korea town in uh, Manhattan is actually really small. I was just it's walking vertical. there. With, yeah, I was walking there with my friend, <laughs> and he ran into another friend from California. Oh, wait. Yeah, because it's like there's only one street, <laughs> and that's where all the Koreans go when they visit New York. Has everything like Hanada, yeah. cafe, sauna, norebang, pc has everything. But like all packed on the one street. It's like one one block basically. Wow. Yeah. It's spreading. It's it's we go to Thirty Third sometimes. It's spreading. <laughs> yeah, I don't so it's know. Thirty Second yeah. Street. Yeah, you're just smiling and nodding. Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'm from California. I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. (laughs) I guess to tie it back, I would say my dosage of Korea when I'm in New York comes from Korea town in oh, Manhattan. Oh, okay. And did you grow up like in that area? I grew up mostly in Bergen County, New Jersey, which has its fair share of Koreans mm-hmm. too. So when did your dad come to the U.S.? He came to the U.S. for university after mm-hmm. he had completed, I think, Kunde and some school after that mm-hmm. in Korea. He mm-hmm. came and he attended Montana University. Mm-hmm. So just so everyone knows, like Montana University has a very generous international student program oh. my philosophy is that like the population of stays four so they'll take anyone because <laughs> like my dad wasn't the brightest in the class for sure uh-huh. so he attended montana and that's where he met my native american mother who's oh. also a student so is your mother from montana or my mother's from new mexico new mexico okay our tribe is acma okay. and it's called pueblo of acma we're based in new mexico okay for mm-hmm. sure now I'm not really sure much about Native American culture and how you would consider it to be passed down yes. through generations. So, like, here you are saying you're from a certain tribe, mm-hmm. but you lived there only for one year at a really young age, right? Yeah. So is that still, let's say, simply by having the bloodline in you, you could call yourself like, yes, this is my tribe, or are you required to understand part of the culture? Are you required to live a certain way of life in order to be considered part of that tribe? Uh, I think... To each their own, Mm -hmm. the way I feel like so to be fair, I would take that same example and say, like, would you call yourself a minimalist if you own so much stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, what is a minimalist? Is it like a way of life Mm -hmm. and is everything like its its own purpose? Mm -hmm. And I think to call yourself Native American, sure, 50 percent of my blood is on paper. Mm -hmm. But culturally, what I've always said is like I'm 50 percent Native American and 50 percent Korean. Mm -hmm. You have two parents who are each of those things. But it culturally, like, 99% Korean. Mm, mm. And I leave the 1% because there are holidays and there's, uh, you know, spirit bowls and prayers and cornmeal, you know, rituals that, that I think I have memories of. Mm. There's just some part of me that, that mm. also, you know, thinks <clears throat> more of my indigenous side. Mm-mm. And when I study it, it and when I, you know, it's weird. You can go out in nature and you just kind of remember the ways that... My aunts and my and my mother would speak about nature, and they speak about things. Mm. So the philosophy of Native Americans is that everything has a spirit, Mm-mm-mm. which is why they're very like anti uh, pollution, mm-hmm. very generous to the earth, very big on giving, very mm. welcoming. Because you want all spirits to be treated with respect, mm. and with gratitude, and thankfulness, and they just move a lot slower through life in that way Mm-mm-mm. because they're more like in the moment and absorbing, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But there's so like for me to even say that, I think I have like the one percent comes from that. So where did you pick up like that? Like so you spent a little bit of time with your mother and your aunt and like through that, that's where you absorb most of the culture. Or you studied a lot of it or uh so got the bulk of it as a child uh-huh. when I when I was young and I remember so what happens as a child though, I didn't know there was anything else. Okay. So when I was on the reservation, it never occurred to me that I was poor. It never occurred to me that like my mother was poor. It never occurred to me that uh, we were essentially in a bubble and that people lived a different way mm. and that there was running water and electricity in different parts of the state. Mm-hmm. And when I would go up, we, every uh, my tribe has a sacred rock, which we call the Mesa, and you go up to visit it every feast day. 
And it's just so through those experiences uh, that I that I learned of like, this is what it's like to be indigenous. And you see people get dressed up and they paint and they and they play instruments and they do dances on the feast day to thank the spirits for like a good harvest. Mm. So it's, it's typically what well, you might think of our version of Thanksgiving in the mm. States. It's mm. their feast day, which happens in September. Mm-hmm. But being on the reservation, looking how I looked even as a child, because Asian features are so dominant, it was very clear that I was I was different. Mm-hmm. And I was the only Korean, I'd say, at all of these events. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And my mother, who looks, you know, nothing like me, they look at her and be like, she's, she's yours. Like, <laughs> yeah, this is my daughter. These Aww. are my daughters, uh, both of us. But my sister has more of the, uh, my mother's genes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I think she looks even less Asian uh, than I do for sure. Mm-hmm. She has more Native American features. Native American, but she 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 came out like almost a a, a, a Caucasian. <laughs> <laughs> Popped out like a Caucasian. <laughs> right. Yeah, but your sister doesn't live with you Mm-mm. right now. But she was with you growing up with your dad, right? She was. You guys lived together with your father. Yeah. And did your dad speak English fluently when you guys were growing up? Did you speak Korean at home? What was maybe a main language? We mostly spoke Korean at home, but he would switch to English when, so he'd be giving like all these, you know, uh, in Korean, like the chansori that happened so much in my household. <laughs> that's be, uh, for all you non initiated folk, that's like nagging, yeah, basically. Lectures. Which you, everyone with the Korean parent will yeah. understand. <laughs> so that'll all be in Korean, right? Uh-huh. But the minute he gets the message where he goes, I need you to understand this, full on English. Uh-huh. So where it's like, you need to like make honor roll for sure uh-huh. he'll put that in english for sure mm-hmm. uh so it was a mix of korean and english i'd say that he wasn't as confident as he was in english because i remember being in third grade and he'd say hey can you like call up psng who's our electric provider and like say they got this wrong because he wouldn't feel confident mm-hmm. enough to get on the phone with yeah. a customer service person to speak english mm-hmm. so here i was i'd be like hey it's mr lim <laughs> this is my account <laughs> number hi it's mr lim <laughs> <laughs> and every time they'd say, can you verify, like, you know, your, your passcode? I'd be like, Appa, what's the passcode? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And my dad would, like, be flipping through his uh-huh. notes. So those things I handle for him. Uh-huh. Um, but he was, I think, he, he, you know, now he's much better in both. He learns a lot of English through television. Mm-hmm. Oh, so his English actually improved over time. You could see it. Thank God. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool because I feel like a lot of the people that I know who are, like, after a certain age, it doesn't matter how long you live in the country. Mm-hmm. It's just, like, your language doesn't improve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you. I, I do f- feel that with some like ajumas or ajishidur like that I know in the states I do feel like at a point like maybe they don't require as much like English right, or right. like they're more comfortable with their situation or their kids will yeah. translate for them he bought an Alexa so I think that helped a lot <laughs> oh really <laughs> yeah that's actually that's probably not a bad idea to be honest like just making yourself speak out loud the first question he asked her when 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 we got her you know started was like, Alexa can you speak Korean? And she just ran through all the languages she can speak, and Korean was not one of them. And I was like, oh. wow, Bezos, like, you're going to list all these languages out there in Korean, which yeah, is one of the fastest growing Bezos? economies, isn't it? Yeah, he's slipping, though, because that's what my parents did, too. They asked Google. They got Google Home, oh, and they asked it, yeah, oh, if they wow. could, it could speak Korean, and it does. So when you're growing up with your dad, were you ever encouraged um, from your family to learn more about your Native American side? Did you ever feel a draw like, you know what, I should understand both sides of cultures? Or did you just think, okay, I'm Korean? That came in high school. Mm -hmm. And it came because I had my friends tell me this big lie about if you're Native American, you can go to college for free. And I was like, wow, my dad's going to love that. Let me see what this is all about. (laughs) So I look into this. Uh, It was not true. I qualify in my Indian blood certificate for over the percentage, which was like, I think uh, the percentage is like 12.5% or something. Mm. And to qualify as free, you have to be going to that state's university, Mm -mm. which if you think about where those tribe states are, they're not the best universities you want to attend. Mm -mm. And that's where it was sort of sparked. Like, okay, what it means to be Native American. And the Mm -hmm. essay prompts are like, describe to us what your Native American experience is like. And I was like, well, Jade, I haven't had any. Mm -hmm. So after about 12 years of not seeing my mother, I figured, let me go and fly back to this place where I once grew up, see what this is about, reunite with her. Uh, It would be our second time meeting as a young adult, or first time, and then she came for my graduation. Well, we're going to get back to talking more about this experience right after this quick break. (laughs) 
Thank you for listening to The Happy Project. We hope you like what you're hearing. We also hope that you will discover us on YouTube. We're at The Happy Project channel as well, where you can watch interviews and videos with our guests. We have the website at thehappyproject.com where there are more photos and stories that can be found there as well as a community page where you can leave your own photos or experiences for others to see. And find us on Instagram, of course, at The Happy Project. If you're looking to get in touch with us, you can email us at thehappyproject at gmail.com. All right, so jumping back into where we left off, you are mentioning that because of these questions you're getting on your essays to apply to university, right? Because you're thinking, I'm going to university for free because I'm Native American. And then you found that's not true. But if there was one good thing, it did spark this kind of curiosity in you to learn more about your Native American side. It did. And not to be mistaken that I went like over a decade without thinking about my mom. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I prayed and I wish and I hoped that she would come back, you Mm -hmm. know, to the family. So, of course, that curiosity was always there as a child. Like, what is she doing? It was like your first thought. Like when your parent decides to not ever come back to the house, like what the heck happened? Mm -hmm. And no one ever sat me down and said, by the way, she's not coming back. Mm -hmm. So I was like, Okay. Mm. So, you know, there was there was that always lingering there, but she wasn't as tied to being Native American as she is today, mm-hmm. as, as I think of her today. Mm-hmm. Back then, it was just my mom is my mom, and I didn't know what culture she was. And then I go and I visit her and I see what this culture is about and how it's different and even different from just the U.S. culture. Sure. For sure. And the mindset and the values that they have. But, yeah, that's when that's when it kind of happened. So you visited the reservation where your mom was living, right? Mm-hmm. How long did you stay there for? I think I was there a, uh, about a week, and I would call, go around feast day, mm. which was in September. Super Something more hot. about feast day? Like, what happens during this time? Uh, so feast day is, again, so it's their version of Thanksgiving, and you come up maybe the day or two days prior. Mm. So it happens on this huge red rock, and tourists are usually not allowed Tor- only on tourists tourists, uh, tourists. This, wait okay, uh-huh. so is this for all native americans or your tribe, tribe. Specifi- uh, specifically mm-hmm. okay, for, sure. for the acoma uh for the acoma tribe it's a giant red rock tourists are usually not allowed but on feast day they allow tourists to come up but there's no photos to be oh, taken uh-huh, uh-huh. and you want to it's a very open door policy the homes are made out of like a alabaster like a like a sand kind of material Mm. they withstand all the weather which is which is so incredible and i remember i watching our house get built when i was five and getting to be there at like you know 17 and like Mm. wow it's finished this is insane Mm. and we're in it (laughs) um there's no electricity on top of the rock no running water when i first visited i packed like my straightener my iphone thinking like my makeup and it can't even wash my hands like that didn't happen and yeah so i I just so feast day is this all open door policy. Mm-hmm. Everyone has an open door. You go in, you sit down, and you eat just the entire day. Mm-hmm. Uh, around late afternoon, they have the dancers come out. And the way, it's called the plaza, which is the center of the, of the rocks and all the homes. And you'll have the dancers come in direction, I think it's north, west, south, east. Mm-hmm. Or it might be the other way around. And what they do is, uh, the, the whole purpose of the dance is to express the gratitude for the great summer harvest. Mm-hmm. And everyone from senior citizens, maybe above 80 years old, to children as young as six are all painted and dressed for this with bells and feathers and reds and and just, you know, family hand-me-downs and heirlooms. Mm -hmm. And it's a gorgeous dance. My family, my aunts, I have two older aunt twins. They always take part in it. Um, We have people uh, always cooking all the time Mm -hmm. and just times like reunite and be together. It sounds... There's also no, like, service on the the rocks. Like, you have to just, like... There's no oh. option to even be anywhere else. You mm. just have to be there. You have to be present. Mm-hmm. It sounds like a really amazingly rich cultural experience that is still existing so powerfully, even if it's in like these small communities. And so it's really cool that you get to be a part of that. Did you ever actually like partake in the ceremony, like wearing all of the heirlooms and doing any of the dance? Did you ever get to do any of that? Uh, you know, I, I thought about it when I first saw it. I was like, I want to come back next year and do this. Mm. But then there's other part of me that's like, but you're not even this. Uh-huh. Like, this isn't even you. Like, what an imposter. You're going to come in and be a part of this ritual? You don't even harvest. So we have tribes of Akuma. My clan is water. Clan is matrilineal, by matrilineal arrangements. Mm-hmm. comes from my mother's side. Mm-hmm. And for the water clan, what you do, I think around 12 or 16 in that range, you carry a pot of water on your head and you go for like a two to three mile journey. Mm-hmm. And you deliver the pot to the war chiefs who are out in the field giving prayers. And they will drink all the water and give you something for remaining. But it's a long journey with this giant pot of water above your head, 
And that sort of, you know, gives you the integrity and I think a lot of the honor to partake in more of, of the activities like that. Mm-hmm. And I didn't do any of that. It's like a coming of age. Coming of age. Coming right, of age thing. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that kind of what it's considered as? Uh, I think for us, for the water clan, it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you don't partake in that, then what does that mean? I wouldn't know. I think they always, I wasn't sure. Mm. Uh, no one ever told me that I was not Akuma. No one ever told me to ever deny that I was ever Native American. <laughs> My aunt would say, I asked her, I was like, you know, auntie, like, what does it mean to be Akuma? She goes, to be Akuma means that you always have a home. Mm-hmm. And I was like, mm, it doesn't feel like that for me. Mm. So you never felt really like fully welcomed or fully comfortable. No. And I think I also like, didn't want to. I think mm. at, a, at a point I just resented my mother. Mm. I was sort of like, you know, you never came back and you're living this chill life and you're happy and I don't want to be near you. And maybe that was where I sort of severed the ties about being Native American. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was much harder to be Native American than it is to be Korean in Bergen County, in New York, and especially at Rutgers. And at Rutgers, if you're going to pride yourself on having so many multinational student organizations when you recruit, there wasn't one for Native American. So I started one. That's where I met Renee. Mm. Renee then, is the friend, by the way, that we were together. And oh, one day okay, Renee recognized sure. me yeah. and then introduced us. And right. then I started this club. It's impossible to build something very well if you're not that passionate about it. And I was just checking all the boxes, but my heart wasn't into it anymore. Mm-hmm. I was like, I started up. I was like, screw this. I'm not that bought into it. Just call a spade a spade, Kayla Lim, and you were raised by a Korean father in a northern part of New Jersey. That was easy to be Korean. And you worked in a Korean supermarket. Like, it is what it is. Mm. What made you want to start that, though? Curiosity. I think it's it's this whole, like, okay, if you're by blood half, let's give equal amounts to half. Did you feel obligated? Did you feel like, oh, I, I have to because, I mean, just naturally I'm born this way, so I feel obligated to understand this other half of me? I think I have a lot of Korean friends who have no idea how to even speak the language or like eat Korean food mm. so I don't think I ever felt obliged or that there should be an obligation it was just mere curiosity mm. like what's this about and a part of like if Rutgers is going to say that it's this we're going to make it this <laughs> and I, I made sure that they gave us like the funding for it and, and the and the PR for it and it was good to do got the experience got to meet some other history and anthropology majors who were very interested in, mm. in the culture but I think felt like I was doing it an injustice when people asked me about what it's like to be Native because I didn't I, I didn't live a Native upbringing. Mm. How different do you imagine you yourself would have been if you did have also Native American upbringing as part of your, your growing up? I, so culture is taught. And if my mother stayed with us in New Jersey, that would have been way different. I can't even begin to fathom what, what that upbringing would have been like to be backed by both parents. But I think that... Let's say I'd gone with my mother instead of my father. Like That's a little easier to imagine. Like your father, what you had been through, invalidated, and just with your mother on the reservation, I would be nowhere near where I am today. Mm-hmm. They don't have enough access to all of the educational resources that I think my high school and my university did. I have a cousin who's just a couple years older, was already pregnant, uh, had her, had I think one, one already, and another was on the way. Uh, a lot of people get involved with drugs really fast. Everyone begins to work in the casinos. It's just this huge bubble. Mm. And I think that family loves to stick together. And when you fail to ask yourself what else is out there, and if it's even possible for you to get out, because it's, it's likely that you're poor. So I, I think about that and I, I get more grateful for having a Northeastern upbringing. Mm-hmm. Interesting you say Northeastern upbringing rather than like Korean upbringing when we were talking about your Native American side. I was thinking like geography of the States. Uh-huh. Right. Sure, that's sure. like the French, uh, New Mexico and like New Jersey and New York. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Location wise, sure. Um, for your dad, because you were brought up, you would say, in a Korean style upbringing. You had your Korean totally, dad. Totally, totally. Wasn't that hard? I mean, it's already hard being in a single parent home, but especially if your dad doesn't speak English fluently, let's say. And then also, you know, maybe, I don't know how, if your dad ever addressed to you guys about your your mixed blood. Did he ever mention any of this? Was this ever oh, he hated part it. of your conversation? Oh, he hated he it. He hated it. Really? He, he would always say, so uh, just to, to preface, I used to think all Korean men were strict as my dad. Mm. And then I found out my father is like the epitome of strict and tough and mean and and everything and unloving and tough love. Like he was just so... Uh, like the extremes of all those things that you can imagine, right? Yeah. I think a white kid would be like, your father's me. abusive. And I'm mm. sure he was. In, in many ways, hands down, he was, right? And he would say things to us like, a full Korean girl would have thrown out the trash by now. 
a full what? Korean girl would, you know, have done the dishes cleaner. And because you carry this half of you that's your mom who's slow and lazy, you're not catching it up quicker. And he, I think he just kind of regretted that. And he he really wished he had married a Korean woman. Mm. There were times where it would scare me. And I was like, oh, God, like your father hates you. And my mo- my sister, who, who resembles more of my mother, right, mm. who is kind of a spinning image in some ways, has to deal with it even harder. And mm. she's firstborn. So as a firstborn, I think you get the brute of it uh, tougher than the mm. second. Right. Do you think that really had to do with necessary, like the, kunyang, like the, being mixed blood could tattoo or because you looked you resembled your mother as opposed to like the culture itself that he resented or just the fact that you reminded him of your mother i think it could have just been that he was uh frustrated he just needed something to like say this is why i hate you right now mm. and be like okay mm. were you able to i can imagine that this is really could have been very difficult to come to terms with, especially with your father telling you these kind of things. But in your own case, were you able to ever, or did you ever feel like you properly addressed that and fully accepted yourself for being mixed? Because a lot of this idea, like when we talk to other people in interviews, a lot of it, especially parents, has to do with the parents and the upbringing and kind of explaining to your child or giving them full love and acceptance for being half. One good question that we had had from one parent when, he, when I asked him, what would you say to parents of mixed kids? Mm-hmm. He said, the first thing I would say is, do you accept that your child is mixed? Mm. He said, that's the first thing I would say. Remember, this was Lauren. Mm-hmm. Right. And I find that to be a very significant question. And so in this case, looking at you and the way the things that you might have heard growing up, did you ever, were you ever able to or did you ever feel fully accepted for being mixed or even yourself, could you ever come to terms with that? Like, hey, I'm mixed and I'm okay with that. You know, it's hard to answer. Did I ever f- be fully accepted by who? I guess by the people around you, but first and foremost, yourself. Okay. Like, did I ever accept like, okay, I am mixed and I'm happy with that and I'm okay with that? Yeah, I think so. Mm-hmm. I think I, I became very proud to be Korean uh, in high school and university and became proud to be Native American. And like when the real when the realization comes, so like you grew up in a Korean household, you are 99% Korean. When that like came, I was like, and it is what it is, I was even happier. Mm-mm. So that really didn't have too much of like a long lasting effect to you. Yeah. I think you're a very strong individual, I have to say. Yeah, to, to hear that kind of stuff and to come out, you know, mm. accepting of yourself, I mm. feel like you have to be a strong person. So I have another question you were saying. So remind me if the pronunciation is correct, is Akami, Akame tribe? Akama. Akama. A C O M A. Akama. A C O M A. So Akama tribe was saying to be Akama means to always have a home. Mm-hmm. Right. So in your case, you were saying the reservation didn't really feel like it was a home. No, it didn't. Where then would you say is your home? And does that define who you are in any aspects? I think so. So home, hands down, is New York City. Hmm. Home is New York. Love that place. Feel the most like myself. And not in a sense of comfort of like, mm. I can take a deep breath. But in a sense of like discomfort, figure it out, hustle hard, like let's do your best. Like the, the, the city just grooms. It sounded so New York. Yeah. It just grooms you, boom, boom, boom. right? And mm-hmm. I love that. But second home is not the home I grew up in. It was so turbulent, mm-hmm. never felt safe, hated coming in, had to brace myself every time for like my Korean father who probably has a slipper in his hand, you know, just mm-hmm. always just scared. Mm-hmm. And I think that. The other part of home was was my grandma's apartment here in Seoul, mm-hmm. and how that proved itself to be home was when uh, there was there was a good quarter I was unemployed, and I had gone through a really bad breakup, had quit my job to potentially move with him. We broke up, so I was unemployed, heartbroken, and, and it was a, just such a you're terrible right place. And my father was like, "You're not living under my roof, unemployed," and I had no motivation to find a job, which is very unlike me. But I really was just really like sad Mm -mm, and i figured if you're not gonna take me in i'm just gonna go to grandma's because i don't know where else to go (laughs) so i booked a ticket to seoul and i and i lived here for a couple of months in her apartment just trying to get my life back on my feet and i'd work these weird hours as i was submitting resumes and cover letters while i'm here but that's when uh seoul definitely felt more like home Mm -hmm. and the buzzing effect that it has i live really close to hangang which is the uh, han river Mm -hmm. love that sound like, that is a sound I can fall asleep to. The really quiet sound that I now hear in the California is just mind-numbing. Do you ever imagine yourself living here in Korea, and would you be happy here, do you think? 
I think so. I love the city of Seoul. So efficient. Yeah. I really love, I love your honesty, first of all. Like, we right. really appreciate you just coming up and just sharing these things. Because yeah. I guarantee you that there are people who may have had similar experiences to you and maybe feel alone or are afraid to talk about it. Because when it comes to culture, identity, and family, like, it can get pretty sensitive and sometimes hard to even put into words. Mm. And so you seem to have really thought through and been able to express it really well. So first and foremost, I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you for the great questions. Oh, yeah. I'm glad that you're answering them, Jay. Yeah, you've been on fire. Feel free to hop in anytime. (laughs) I'm just listening. I'm captivated (laughs) by, you know, this frank discussion. Yeah, it's it's really wonderful. Um, This is something else I was curious about because, actually, I think about this myself. Yeah. Um... So, so I look at my older sister, also my older sister, half Korean, half white American, and married um, white American man who had never stepped the foot out of the U.S. until really? he met my sister. Like, he had never encountered anything about Korean culture, never tried any other food, like Korean food, ever. Um, and I can foresee, of course, I can be wrong, but I can foresee that um, as they have kids and then, you know, as their kids grow up, that the Korean culture that my sister grew up with, I can imagine it can either vanish or will be watered down and not really mm. passed on to her children. Again, I could be wrong. I can't speak for her. But um, like you were saying, culture is taught. So in your case, you are carrying these two cultures with you, one to more or other less degree. But for yourself, say in the future, if you ever had a family or you ever wanted to pass on your cultures, Do you think you would want to? Would you want to pass on your Korean culture and your Native American culture? Would that be important to you? The Korean culture, 100%. Whether I marry Korean or I don't, 100%. And I say that because I, what it means to be half Korean to me, like what it means to be Korean means to be disciplined. Mm -hmm. Because it was my Korean father who taught me discipline. And he learned discipline because the country was coming out of a really terrible economy Mm -hmm. and he was poor so for sure korean i would give the native american part a choice Mm -hmm. because to be native american means that they meet their grandma and it's like will grandma be in the picture i don't know Mm. if i take my child to the reservation are people going to going to be like who is this and have to pull out my identification card Mm. which is not a way you want to enter your home to have to be like i am of this culture here's my blood degree is that what you have to do every time you go to the reservation? I didn't have to do it as a child, but I remember. So, I Could I you said, explain a little bit more about this blood degree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, y- you can have it's called the certificate of Indian blood, mm-hmm. and it just indicates what love, what percentage of Indian blood you have. Oh, okay. so by like all your tribes kind of checks out to prove. Otherwise, you'd have a ton of people checking that they're all about these tribes. Uh-uh. Probably make one up. That's what that is. And you can have a certificate form and a card. And I have both. My okay. mother uh, had, had got me both and got me documented. Mm. And the way so this mountain is beautiful in that it there has some caves and stairs and the way you climb it and how you can run on it. And like you can make these leaps where you're like, will I make it? And you can jump far. And it's just this incredible mountain. And it, no tourists are allowed up except feast day, right? And one random day, wasn't feast day, and I told my mom, like, I want to go up to the mountain, or I want to go up to the mesa. And we were going up, and we get stopped. And he goes, who's she? Because mm. I don't look indigenous. She goes, she can't. He didn't even look. He's like, she can't go up. And I started to cry in the passenger seat. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? Why? Mom, tell me who I am. Like, why can't I go up? And she was like, this is Kayla, my daughter. And he took his shades off and like looked at me. And he was my uncle's brother, wow. who was the mayor of, of, of this area. And she goes, you know, we're we're Shativa's like relatives, and he kind of gave us a hard time about it, and eventually let us pass. But it's not, it didn't feel like at that time. I was like, I just want to go home. If you're gonna tell me that I can't go on this rock, like I don't want to be on this rock. Mm-mm. And it, I spoke about this with um my older cousin, who is the daughter of the mayor's brother, and and I asked her. She had she had taken out her professional life in Washington D.C., and I told her about this experience, and she said the same thing. And it's because she just didn't look as native anymore. Mm -mm. And I think that maybe there's a xenophobia there. Maybe that's just sacred. Mm. But that's where it felt like, oh, this is not home. I am not welcomed. I have two questions kind of jumping off of that. The first one is, at what percentage of bloodline, of Native American blood, are you considered still Native American? At what percentage does are you then no longer part of, like, let's say, Native American bloodline? You know, if you're one-eighth Native American, could you still be and could you still be accepted as Native American? Or is that one-fourth 
or at half, already you're coming to these kind of difficulties. And what is that percentage, do you think? I think uh, federal recognizes one sixteenth, mm -hmm. up to one sixteenth. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with your family, it shouldn't matter. Sure. Yeah. And then my second question is, because when I look at you, I actually see a really blend of both. I oh. see Native American. I see Korean. When I, I look don't at get you. that very often. Oh yeah. I get full Korean. Oh. Yeah, I think but then when I, when half I these are at looking you. at me. Yeah, mostly mm -hmm. like white or green. Right. Sure. No, I see like a pretty strong blend. Oh. Um, but I'm wondering what other experiences maybe you could share with us about being judged or perceived differently, specifically only because of your appearance. Hmm, I'd say in Seoul, the first skincare line I get sold is like whitening. Mm. They mm -hmm. all assume I want to be whiter, so they're like, "Oh, come check out our whitening line." And I was like. Listen, lady, I pay 40 bucks for this bronzer. This is intentional. <laughs> and I live in California. I'm sunbathing even like if I don't want to because the sun is out 300 <laughs> days a year. So that's one, mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, I'm tall. Yes. That comes from my mother, who's tall. taller than my father. Oh. Yeah, she's she's a big boned Native American woman. My, my sister lost that gene. She's, she's, she's short. <laughs> <laughs> Got the Korean gene, I just guess. like me. <laughs> and... I remember uh, when we would enter the restaurants as a group with my family in New Mexico, say Albuquerque, you know, like the city where you'd hope there's more than just Native Americans, but U.S. citizens. And we'd walk in as a group. If I'm at the tail end, the hostess would often be like, excuse me, miss, like what, what party are you with? And I was like, with the one I was walking in with. Mm -hmm. But because I don't look like them, she just thinks I'm with someone else or I'm different. And I've also learned that there's a strong Vietnamese culture in our Vietnamese population in, mm. in New Mexico, mm -hmm. which I didn't know. And they would assume That's that I was... kind of surprising, actually. I never heard yeah. that before. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they would assume that I uh, was Vietnamese. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. yeah. and so I how think, did that make you yeah. feel when like people would just assume you're not like a part of your family? The first, uh, I think, reaction to your heart is, is just hurt. Right. Right? And just hurt. And I think as I got older, what really is just ignorance. And then I let it go. Mm -hmm. I kind of just think, like, don't water off a duck's back. Yeah. You don't want to get too hung up on, on things like that. Yeah, because these are people who will come into your life once in quick passing. And they have no impact on who you really are and where you're going to go in the future. And so to allow such an insignificant moment in your life to affect you in a big way, considering your identity or your the way you view yourself or accepting yourself, I think that would really be doing a disservice to who you are. And yeah. so I really love to hear that from you because um, we have heard that from other guests as well who will say, like, I don't think it's coming from a place of hatred per se. It's mostly out of ignorance. And so that's why you sharing these kind of stories is so significant because it is just your personal experiences. Yes, to some people they say, oh, it's just her story. Mm -hmm. But in reality, what you're actually doing is sharing this kind of awareness to people so that we don't have this kind of ignorance, so that we can avoid this kind of hurt in the future. Um, besides your sister, mm -hmm. do you know any other Native American Korean people? Not directly, but I've heard there is one couple in Pennsylvania who's a Korean woman that married not just any Native American, but like the chief, which is which is uh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, so he, I know they exist. I have no idea who they are mm -hmm. or what tribe it is, mm -hmm. but I've heard someone's. I think two people have told me that. They're like, oh, did you hear? Like, they she, he married a, a Korean woman. Mm -hmm. I was like, nice. Right, is, bye. is it newsworthy because like uh, the chief will typically not marry someone outside of like Native? American bloodlines, or uh, he might marry a white woman, or like okay. you know, but to marry like a Korean, it was mm -hmm. just like, wow, interesting. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> yeah, honestly, before I met you, like I had never even heard of anybody like Native American marrying Korean. Like I, this I never heard about. You can't this. believe how my grandmother reacted. My Korean grandmother, oh. she was like, Native what? Like what is that? Yeah. Like there before the white people, <laughs> like what? <laughs> I would say, yeah, I don't know too much about like what education in Korea would be considering Native Americans. I don't yeah. know. If... Considering it's really bad in the U.S., yeah, like, like I'm sure, yeah. I I really have to. We know we should probably look into that. I'd be very curious. If any listeners know, please let us know because I'm definitely curious on that. Um, would you want to meet anybody who is half Korean Native American? Would you be curious about that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think that'd be that'd be awesome. Yeah. That would be really cool. I hope we have more guests who are also Native American and Korean, and maybe we can also hear their experiences with your experiences. That would be really cool. Um, and then I guess the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, 
for perhaps anybody who is in your shoes, if you can imagine somebody who maybe had a similar upbringing to you or maybe heard things also growing up, things that you had heard, what would be something you would want to say to other Hafis out there who maybe have a similar circumstance as you had? Great question. For someone in my shoes, what would I want to say? I would say just do it. Really, like full on Nike, like just do it. <laughs> just don't even think too hard about it. Don't ponder too hard about it. Don't journal too much or write too much about it. Just go out there and do it and like put it to the water and see and test it out. If you have any thoughts on like what's this culture like, go out and live there. If you are curious about what it's like to be happy, reach out to the happy project. Like you just need to pursue what you wonder. Hmm. You can spend a whole lot of time thinking and wondering, but just put some action behind your words. I think maybe that will be. It's probably really the only way to kind of learn about culture. I think obviously we always always say like, oh, immerse yourself in the culture if you really want to learn the culture and the people. But especially when it comes to understanding a culture that you might want to call your own, that's even more significant. So I think that's really great words. And also I like how you said don't think too much about it, right? It's very easy to, for us, I think, to get in your headspace. Right, those long nights, you know, when you're just laying on your bed and you're just like, who am I? You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Yeah, of course. And you can write poems, you can write songs and sad journal entries. You can do all of that. There's no harm in it. But I actually would really agree with you because that's what I did. You know, finally you make a step and say, okay, I'll make a physical choice. I'm really curious about it. And I think it's really important enough yeah. for you to be able to um, take a part of some years in your life to come to Korea to ask these questions to meet your family to reach out and learn this part of who you are I think what also falls under thinking is that you can see a bunch of influencers and idols out there who are also half and begin to think that you're like them which in some ways could be true but I'm gonna bet that you're completely different and that like you are your own and that's not going to be discovered if you keep thinking and, li- and kind of living under someone else's umbrella Mm-mm. that's a really fair point This maybe kind of goes into the question of representation. Like, obviously, you want to have representation in the media. The reason I bring this up is because Crazy Rich Asians. And I was thinking, like... Very overrated movie, in my opinion. (laughs) So, it kind of goes along with that. Like, Crazy Rich Asians was so crazy. Like, everyone was like... (laughs) Everyone (laughs) loved it, right? They're like, oh, my gosh, Asians on TV. Which, on one hand, I see, like, great representation, okay? To see, like, somebody who looks like you on TV. It was like a full cast behind the scenes, too. Like, post-production. Absolutely. Okay, I didn't even know that. This Mm -hmm. is true. And that's... I think that is also very significant. And there's no way we downplay that. But, on the other hand, to simply stop there and be like, oh, yay, that's the same thing as me. I'm that person. I've seen myself on TV. Like, there's a difference between viewing somebody else living the kind of life that you imagine, oh, this is what it must be to be Asian right. or this so-and-so culture and versus experiencing it yourself. Like a full variety of people or like identities you could be. You know what I mean? That's yeah. what I really love about today's media landscape. You could see Asians that are like kind of losers or druggies or criminals. <laughs> and, and they're not just all math nerds or like mm-hmm. kung fu athletes or you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. like, It used to be like three stereotypes that you pick from, but now you could see... Yeah, you could be a criminal. You could be <laughs> you could be a successful businessman. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're not just shoehorned into one particular character mm-hmm, or stereotype yeah. and I think that's really powerful. You could be a hero. Did you watch Searching? I didn't, but I heard good things about it. Movie is amazing. Yeah. Okay. It's a great movie. I, I just wanna say um thank you, Kayla, for being so frank with us and just telling us about your experiences. Of course, I already said this thank you before, but I really mean it. I think it's very significant. And even myself coming like with Hafi myself being mixed and like coming from two different cultures and also doing similar thing as you did, like trying to learn both of these cultures, embracing this all about myself as well. Um, it's so great to hear your own story and in ways like relate to this journey. Um, and oh, thank I, you. I think that that's really powerful because um, we hope that there are people who are listening to your story and who will be touched by this and maybe encouraged, you know, to ask those questions about themselves and, and to not be afraid to wonder who am I in this, this question of identity and all of that and maybe even enjoy it. Because I feel like you have enjoyed your life. You are bright and you're smiling. And I don't want to like throw that on you like you're a happy person. But I just get this feeling from <laughs> you. And I hope that's true. I hope that you are happy with yourself. Oh, and thanks. the way you've come through with everything. Um, before we sign off, is there any last thing that you have to say to us or anything you'd like to 
bring up. I appreciated the session. Thanks for the awesome questions. And it was so much fun to be on here with you and to get to do this podcast. So I'm excited for it to get released and for many more to come. So cheers to that, too. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, yeah, and I just wanted to add, on top of Becky's, you know, really eloquent thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I actually I learned a lot too and I really appreciated your rawness and your frankness mm-hmm. too so thank you for that of course of course I think you know your listeners deserve nothing less yeah you guys heard that right you guys the best so Kayla once again thank you so much Jay also good to have you in the studio as always. And thank you both for the great conversation. And we'd also like to thank everyone for tuning in. We are going to be back with another podcast episode soon. So be sure to subscribe so you know when to tune in. And you can find us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, also at the website. We have the podcast page, thehappyproject.com. Also subscribe to the YouTube channel, The Happy Project. You can watch more interviews and also the video format of our podcast if you're curious to know who our guests are and kind of what's going on in the studio. You can always get in touch with us at the happy project at gmail.com so one last time thank you jay this time adios (laughs) and thank you kayla thank you becky thank you jay thanks for listening we are the happy project bye is that the one with john cho I don't know actors and actresses okay. too well. I think it is John Cho. I think so. He's yeah. the one who's got really cute ears, right? I never heard <laughs> anyone say that, <laughs> and I never, I can't even say I know what his ears look like, to be honest. <laughs> That's what Becky checks out. Yeah, yeah, his ears down. are just like, ooh, got some ears no. on that guy. <laughs> I just remember seeing He'll them. He'll listen real well. <laughs> <laughs> I just liked his ears, okay, guys? Well, is that a singer thing? Uh, what? I don't Here think I think that's a <laughs> Becky thing. I've never heard that before. And, it's yeah. a singer thing, guys. It's definitely a singer thing. Uh. <laughs>